Moving to agenda item number five today, we are taking evidence from George Adam, MSP, the Minister for Parliamentary Business. This is one of our regular sessions with the Minister on the Scottish Government's work relevant to the Committee. The Minister is accompanied by two Scottish Government officials, Rachel Raynor, the Deputy Legislation Coordinator and the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and Susan Herbert, the Head of the Subordinate Legislation Team, Parliament and Legislation Unit. So may I welcome you all to the meeting. So I can remind you all also not to worry about turning on the microphones during the session as they are controlled by broadcasting. So we're going to invite the Minister to make some opening remarks. Minister. Thank you, Convener. And good morning, Convener and Committee members. And this is the first opportunity I've had to welcome Oliver Mundell, Carol Mochen uh, to the Committee. And uh, as previous members of this committee, I, as a previous member of this committee, I know very well what important part this committee plays in scrutinising all legislation. We have had a close working relationship since I became Minister for Parliamentary Business, and I hope that continues to be the case. When we met in June, I reflected that the first year of this parliament has been very cha challenging. That has continued with the cost of living crisis and the continued situation in Ukraine. As I did in June, I would like to record my thanks to the committee, its officials and indeed the Parliament for the constructive way it has worked with the Government over an extremely busy and challenging time. The remainder of Year 2 and indeed Year 3 will no less be no less challenging, particularly given the measures contained within the UK Government's retained EU Law Bill. We continue to bring a significant amount of legislation to the Parliament. Since September, we've had six bills, 96 SSIs, eight LCMs and 11 UK SIs. The committee will note that there have been a reduction in the number of SSIs laid by the government. There is not a specific reason for this, but I'm delighted to note that in this quarter, no instruments have been reported on serious grounds. As the committee knows, I take the quality of the instruments that we lay very seriously, and it is important that there are as few errors as possible. Government and Parliament officials have been working on a protocol for uh, expedited uh, affirmative instruments following the concerns arising from the use of made affirmative procedure during the pandemic uh, and the committee's inquiry. This work is ongoing and is near completion. When we met in June, I committed to undertake a strategic review of the data and information that the government currently provides to the Parliament. It is worth reminding ourselves of what the government currently provides. A forward look every week of SSIs to be laid in the following two weeks, weekly updates on UK SIs and fortnightly updates on LCMs and also monthly updates on bills. This is a substantial amount of data and is complemented by regular meetings between officials and indeed the meetings that I offer to committee conveners. My officials have been considering carefully the data and the information that we provide to the Parliament and will engage shortly with the committee clerks to seek their input. As ever, it is vital that we work together to ensure that we are providing information and data that is helpful and of value, not only to this committee, but to the Parliament as a whole. And convener, I look forward to hearing from the committee today. Uh, thank you very much for that, Minister. And Minister, I mean, you touched upon just a, a few areas that uh, obviously you will be getting questions on. So, but certainly uh, you're correct regarding the, the number of errors and uh, with the instruments and the committee has uh, highlighted that SSIs and errors are generally low, which would be certainly welcome. Um, but the committee is still uh, identifying uh, some drafting issues. So what are you and your team doing to ensure that the quality of the SSIs remains high? Well, we're continuing with the work that we've done up until now, which has made sure that there are a limited amount of errors made in the first place. Uh, but as I say, we're always willing to engage with everyone else. If there is anything the committee has to offer us and talk to us about, we can look at that as well. But uh, on the whole, uh, most of the drafting has been uh, good and has ensured that we've made be able to bring legislation forward uh, in the right way. So, uh, you know, anything else that's added, we'd be quite happy to look at. But on the whole, it's just a case of making sure that we continue to provide you and the Parliament with uh, the most accurate SSIs and uh, instruments that we possibly can. OK. Uh, so just, um, I'll give uh, kind of one example of where uh, there were particular issues, and that was the, the Scottish Child Payment and Silly Provision Regulations 2022. That was... SSI 2022-326. On the 23rd of November, the committee asked the Scottish Government why a further breach of the 28-day rule had occurred in relation to this. Uh, the committee sought the Scottish Government's assurance that its quality assurance uh, processes were sufficient to ensure that subordinate legislation laid before the Parliament was fit for purpose. 
The Scottish Government responded that a review of its processes for developing it and quality assuring social security regulations would be undertaken uh, to learn lessons and to strengthen the procedure for the future. Can you provide an update on this particular review, please? Yes, uh, the review is ongoing and uh, we provide the Parliament a substantial amount of information. But we're absolutely committed to ensure that uh, we get the Parliament receives information in the time that it needs. Uh, I think for us, the review is getting to the stage we need to engage with the committee more. Uh, we've, all, we've got to a stage where I think my officials will be doing that in the not too distant future. And uh, that will give us some ideas as how we take that forward. But I think the important thing is that we make sure that we've got ourselves into a place where we can have that discussions with your clerks at the committee, my officials, and we can take that forward. OK, no, thank you. I'm sure that uh, uh, colleagues from the the committee would welcome that uh, further engagement. Um, on, also, on the SSI 2022-340, the Building Scotland Amendment uh, number, sorry, Amendment Amendment number two regulations 2022, the instrument amended SSI 2022-136 by amending the date in which new mandatory energy environmental standards for buildings and building work are introduced from the 1st of December 2022 to the 1st of February 2023. The Committee asked the Scottish Government for an explanation for the 28-day breach, given the lane requirements uh, were complied with at the last time the deadline was postponed. The Scottish Government advised that the breach had occurred due to a delay in the last engagement with providers. <clears throat> what processes uh, does the Scottish Government have in place to manage the planning and timescales for delaying planned implementation of legislation? And what is done to ensure that reviews on any delayed implementations are regularly carried out? Well, convener, as a rule, we obviously don't want to be uh, having problems with delayed uh, legislation or 28-day breaches. But on the whole, there's, it can be quite challenging out there for a number of reasons. There may be situations where we do have that uh, problem. And uh, all I can assure the committee is the fact that I, as a minister, uh, ensure that we try and keep everything within the the, 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 the proper way of doing business. Uh, on the whole, that doesn't happen. We are only human. There can be difficulties as well. There, there's also some difficulties with regards to some of the information we might receive from other legislative uh, kind of bodies like Westminster and the UK government, which can give us... We just get to see detail at the very last minute as well. So on the whole, we do try to ensure that we can get everything to you in a timeous matter, uh, time, sorry, uh, but on the whole, it can prove quite challenging on the whole. I don't know if I want to bring in Susan at this point uh, to maybe add something to that. Um, there's nothing really I would add about that. I, I don't know all the detail about the um, instrument um, that the convener raised in, in particular. I don't know if Rachel knows a little bit more about that one. No. But we can come so back to you on that you on actual that instrument in itself. But on the whole, generally speaking, we tend to try and make sure we get these things worked out within the correct times. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, you touched upon there regarding receiving information uh, from uh, from others. Um, I mean, just on that, I mean, is is that uh, is it more common now, or is it just um, on a kind of sporadic in terms of? We're kind of receiving information late. No, uh, it will happen on a regular basis that officials will get information literally, if they're lucky, 24 hours before a bill is published. And that's if they're lucky. They might get it an hour or so before it as well, or uh, the, any of the details that they're needing. So that of automatically sets the gun, uh, fires the gun, starting gun, and it makes it difficult for us to try and get ourselves into a place where we can actually have a robust argument or look at the detail and find how it actually affects us here as well. So uh, it's more difficult. It's made worse because out with the politics that is a situation in itself, you have a you used to be able to build up a relationship, like the relationship my officials have with your clerks or I have with yourselves here at the committee. Uh, when there is a, uh, you have the continued idea of the people you're dealing with, it's quite simple to do that. But if I use some of the people that I deal with in Westminster over the past year and a bit, I've had about in the election side of things, I've had three different ministers 
that I've had to deal with. Uh, so your chances of actually even being able to break down the political barrier and have that working relationship with some in Westminster at a political level becomes more difficult. Uh, and sometimes that's where you can actually solve some of the issues by just having that open working relationship where you say, we're just going to get this job done. You know, we might not agree on the policy issue, but let's uh, try and get the work done. And you're very rarely able to have these conversations because there's been such a turnover of ministers uh, in Westminster. But on the whole, from an official point of view, it becomes extremely difficult for them to actually get to the stage where they can work up a case for whether the government's for or against anything that's going on and do it in such a robust manner that your committee would expect to be able to scrutinise. So I'll maybe bring in uh, Susan. She might be able to hit some of the technical aspects of it. In, in terms of, thank you, Mr. Adam, in terms of legislative consent, um, this has been a particular issue with bills introduced following the Queen's speech last year. Um, so colleagues are often seeing provisions in bills um, very late in the day and sometimes actually not at all. For instance, um, the case of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, um, colleagues did not see um, a final bill print or nor were they engaged in the drafting of clauses. Um, so we didn't actually see anything on that until introduction. So that then makes it really difficult um, to meet the two-week deadline set in start standing orders um, for us to undertake a our own devolution analysis for a pol policy analysis and then to provide advice um, to our ministers and then to lodge um, an LCM within the two-week period. And this is something that we have raised with UK colleagues and I know ministers have also raised with um, their UK um, counterparts, but it has been very difficult, very challenging in the way that the um, the two week period that we are set within standing orders. It's been very difficult for us to meet that in the last um, year. So, so with that, <clears throat> even during um, COVID, uh, uh, the worst of the COVID period, um, that happened at that point because uh, to, to not have any engagement until the bill was actually published. It seems quite remarkable. Um, I generally don't, uh, I don't recall that type of thing happening even throughout the worst of COVID. As uh, the minister, obviously I wasn't the minister at the mm -hmm. time, but I don't recall uh, either being that stage from, literally from the time I have been in post, it has been like this. I don't know if that's been the changes of uh, administration uh, down at Westminster or not, or the leadership themselves. I've got no idea. But on on the side of things, I, Mary, I think I've said this before to you, convener, there's aspects of my job that are very technical, as is this committee, and are just going down the rules and regulations of how we go about day-to-day -day business. And I have actually spoken to uh, Westminster equivalents, uh, ministers, and said, let's not have a fight unless we have to have one. Our jobs have won a process. Let's just try and just get make the process work. Uh, and uh, on the whole, when you do have that relationship and you can have that at a political level, you can talk to the minister at that level. But as I say, that's been proven to be difficult over the past uh, year or so because there's been multiple ministers in various portfolios. And it becomes difficult for, well, it becomes difficult for two reasons. One, it becomes difficult for me to have a working relationship with the individual to just say, right, we're not here to fight, we're just here to get the job done, do our job. Uh, and two, it becomes difficult for officials at both UK and uh, uh, Scottish level because then they have, to, although they may remain the same and have the same working relationships, the person who is in charge, the minister who's making the, the decisions, may have a different personality and a different idea of how they would take things forward. So it becomes difficult for them to engage with them at that stage as well because they don't really know how the minister is going to react to certain things. So it, it's become more and more difficult and it's a bigger, becoming a larger problem. Yeah, so, kind of my final question, just in this area. Um, um, obviously, when the bill, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, was published, uh, Minister, I mean, you will obviously engage with uh, with colleagues from uh, all the, the, the involved administrations as mm -hmm. well as the UK government. Uh, did they have a, a similar experience regarding that particular bill? 
Yes, he did, uh, and uh, we're, we're particularly worked closely with Welsh colleagues as well, and uh, the, with regards to other things. But yeah, with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, uh, they did have these experiences as well, and things have been quite difficult. Okay, okay, okay. Now, I've got one final question before I bring in Bill Kidd. Uh, you touched upon Ukraine uh, in your opening comments. Um, now, obviously, the, the, any of the instruments that came uh, to this committee, uh, they will have breached the 28-day rule, uh, which is understandable. Um, are you anticipating any further instruments coming forward regarding Ukraine? Uh, nothing that I can think of to hand at the moment, but uh, I'll just ask my officials to see if there's anything I've forgotten and they can correct me. Not at the moment. Thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, welcome, Minister and uh, officials. Um, we're not finished with technicalities because I'm just going to ask you a wee bit more um, because it's the relationship between this committee and the ministerial side that you cover um, which does bring this forward. Um, so just to ask you, Minister, your officials provide the committee and subject committees also with a helpful weekly update of instruments expected to be laid in the following two weeks. Um, can you provide an indication... Um, of any anticipated volume of SSIs likely to be laid between now and the summer? Uh, I was just uh, trying to think off the top of my head, Susan. Do we have any numbers that we know for sure? We, we can, excuse me, we can certainly give you a projection with the caveat that, as you know, Mr Kidd, that can, that can change. Um, but we can certainly give you a projection. We have a projection, um, I think we're thinking it, Looking at the moment, we think there'll be about 61 SSIs laid between now and summer recess. But, you know, that is subject to change. Mm -hmm. And we would expect that to go up a little bit. But we can certainly provide you with that. Well, that would be very helpful. Sorry, Minister. Were you yeah, I was going to say the, the fact that, you know, just to give it some... Since September, there's been 96 SSIs. So yeah. just to kind of compare and contrast... Uh, uh, so if, if you think 66 sounds like a lot and we're giving you quite a bit of work. <laughs> right, OK. No, well, that's very helpful, actually, because it just um, it gives us uh, a, an indication of the levels of work that we'll, we'll be anticipating over that period, and that's, that's extremely useful. And obviously it's not something you can give an exact figure on anyway, but mm -hmm. it's just an indication. Um, so following uh, your last session with the committee minister, in correspondence with the committee, you committed to undertake a strategic review of data and information with the Scottish Government um, process um, that you already provide to the committee. The committee appreciates that this review may be in the early planning stages, but can you provide any update at all on that work? Yeah, we're undertaking the review of information sharing and uh, while we hope to have progressed it more than what we have at the moment, uh, we're aiming to engage shortly with parliamentary officials uh, with a view to establishing a short life working group to seek their input into it. So we're at the stage where we will be engaging with uh, our parliamentary officials to get, bring that to uh, the next stage. Uh, it's We probably hope to be a lot further on than what we are, but unfortunately for various reasons, uh, we've actually got to the stage where we're uh, just a wee bit behind what we should have been. OK, but, but you're working on that anyway. Yep, we are so indeed, yep. It's an important aspect. Well, this committee considers packages, if we can put it that way, of SSIs relating to a specific policy area, such as the package of 10 instruments concerning the transfer of functions to the first tier and upper tribunal of Scotland uh, and, and or reform of non-domestic rate system. It's useful for this committee, as well as the relevant subject committees, as you know, to be given as much advance notice as possible of packages of instruments do you have any idea of if um, there are such instruments, sets of instruments in the pipeline, uh, will you be able to keep us updated on the progress that we can expect on these? I think, Mr Kidd, as an answer to that, as a whole, we try to give you as much uh, information and try to make sure you get the detail in, uh, as far in advance as possible. Sometimes that can be difficult and there can be all kind of challenges as well. But on the whole, there's nothing that comes to mind uh, at the moment. But if there is something, I'll make sure that the committee uh, get detail of what they're getting and when they're getting it and how large a package it turns out to be. Great. Well, I mean, as you know, that's very useful for this committee in particular because we do we are the first stage frequently for 
uh, for this to go forward. So that would be extremely useful, and thank you very much for that. Thank no, you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Minister, uh, you, you'll be aware that our uh, predecessor committee welcomed the Scottish Government's work in meeting almost all of its historic commitments uh, by the end of the last parliamentary session. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something the committee certainly wanted to try to uh, progress and, and have a, a clean slate for, uh, for this session. Uh, but there is uh, there's still one uh, outstanding yep. uh, commitment, and that's yep. the and Scotland Act 1988 specification of functions and transfer of property, etc., Order 2019, SSI 2019 uh, Can you provide the committee with an update on uh, where things are with that, please? Uh, I'll, I'll ask one of my officials to give you the full update on that, but in, with regards to uh, this situation of us, there's been a great amount of work done by ourselves, my predecessor and uh, 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 obviously the officials involved to get this to the stage we're at now, because you will remember that in 2018 we were not in a good place uh, with regards to this, uh, these kind of issues. So just to get some idea of where we're at, things are a lot better and we're sitting here with this one. Now with that one, that we're talking about here, I would probably ask Rachel, or it would be Susan, Susan, uh, just to give us an update on it. Thank you. Um, that is a Scotland Act order, um, so that means that we would need to look, have another Scotland Act order as a vehicle um, to correct that, and they are not terribly frequent. Um, but we can, um, I'll go away and ask the lead officials um, on any update if they think there's a vehicle will be forthcoming and give you an update on that. Um, but that's the reason that one has not been met thus far. But let's not get caught in negativity, convener. You know, we're in a better position than what it was previously in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I absolutely agree, because uh, uh, obviously I, I was on the committee in the last session, and uh, I remember the, uh, the long list uh, of outstanding commitments, and, and certainly the committee uh, wanted to have a... Uh, have the situation improved uh, greatly, and I mean, it certainly is. Uh, but simply just on this particular order, um, uh, I'm sure the colleagues would appreciate if you were to write to the committee okay. uh, with an update on uh, when you have that dialogue with your colleagues. No problem, we'll do that, convener. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Oliver. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, um, and thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I was interested in asking, uh, first of all, uh, about Scottish Law Commission uh, bills. Um, obviously, the committee has been scrutinising uh, two, two of them uh, recently. Uh, but in the 2021 programme for government, um, there was a suggestion that the, the, that the government wanted to take forward the implementation of a number of other SLC reports um, in this session. And I just wondered if you were able to enlighten the committee on the, the sort of pipeline and timescale for their introduction and... I guess, how the government goes about sort of prioritising those different reports? Well, on the whole, you'll be aware that we've obviously, as a member of this committee, we've got the Movable Transactions Bill, which came into force. At one point, I was calling it the Unmovable Transactions Bill because it took us so long. I think I came to my very first committee meeting and I said, uh, we will be working towards getting this, and there was a delay of about six months. But it's a highly technical uh, bill and it was one that we had to get into a, a good place in order to make sure that it's so, uh, sorted. You've obviously got the Trust and Successions Bill, which is uh, coming to yourselves as well. So on the whole, uh, you know, we've managed to keep the uh, committee re reasonably busy with Scottish Law Commission stuff. With regards to how we go about uh, the taking on the work, it's basically we know there's a list of stuff that the Law Commission stuff, I don't think that's a technical term, uh, there's, a, there's actually the, a whole list of uh, potential bills there that the Law Commission have got work on and uh, we'll look at as and when what is the priority and what we need to do uh, as a government to take that forward. I'll ask uh, Susan if she's got anything to add to that. No, I don't have anything to add to that, Mr Adam. OK, OK. I mean, I, I guess just to push you a wee bit harder, do, do you have a sort of target for this session? A kind of... Uh, I wouldn't... The backlog? I mean, I guess, um, you know, these these are, you know, high, usually highly technical bills yeah. that come to this committee because they're not, you know, contentious. They're not necessarily easy pieces of legislation, but they're not, they're not politically contentious. And no. I guess the kind of frustration we picked up a little bit of, you know, maybe from, from the SLC... You know, w w w was just that you know there are a number of you know well thought out kind of suggestions for how to mm -hmm. improve law, and we heard it from stakeholders 
you know, certainly in terms of the movable transactions, the big difference you know, a piece of legislation like that would make to oh. how they go about their daily business. And it just was, I, I know it's easy for them to fall down the kind of government's priority list, the parliament's priority list, because there are other things that are maybe politically more exciting. Um, you know, and it, it just, you know, to, to kind of get a commitment from you that you know, these are seriously being looked at no, and the committee will be kept busy. Um, you know, will be kept busy in future They are years. being seriously looked at and we are reviewing uh, what ones we would be looking at bringing forward. But as you say, you know, Parliament and uh, the people of Scotland's idea of what we... And we're living in a cost of living crisis. There's, there's only so many bills and so many bits of legislation that can get in between now and the end of the session. Uh, so it's not a case that we don't see the Scottish Law Commission bills as important. It's just that, you know, we need to just have prioritise uh, what we're going to actually do and still we'll be working to was making sure that the government's uh, programme is delivered as well. So just to try and put your mind at rest, Mr Mundell, uh, we do continually look at what we could bring forward and we do engage to make sure that we can see what could be relevant in the various uh, aspects of uh, life in Scotland and how we can bring them forward. So they're not being forgotten about and they're not going down a big dark hole somewhere in the Scottish government. It's something we're constantly looking at. But uh, again, it comes down to the prioritisation of the government and how we move forward. And we only have so many bills, spots between now and the end of session. I know in year two, that sounds as if we're kind of wishing away our lives almost. But, you know, I've got to look at that as Minister for Parliamentary Business as well. But they're not being forgotten about. And in terms of, I mean, I'm not asking you to, to do it today, but would you be willing to share with the committee, you know, in terms of those reports that are sitting there, just sort of which, you know, not necessarily this specific, you know, sort of, you know, ones, but as in, you know, a group of them, you know, that, that you think might be achievable in this parliament or that you that you consider to be, you know, the, the top of the, of, of the priority list within the... the I'm SSC happy bills, to make a that. commitment that we have a look at it and uh, engage with the committee to see where we're at with everything. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and just on uh, the SLC bills, I mean, obviously during the movable transactions, we got a kind of bit of kickback from uh, some uh, sort of witnesses and, and stakeholders saying that they basically were concerned about bits of the bill and they hadn't been asked about it. And you, the, I mean, it's all there on the parliamentary report. It was covered in the stage one debate, uh, but, but less specifically about the movable transactions. It was again, just to get an assurance from you, you know, that where these bills are being brought forward in future you know, that certainly that the government was was doing its bit to to scope out, you know, any any potential kind of, uh, you know, any potential, I, I guess, what what are more political kind of risks associated with the bill in terms of them, you know, generating yep. public o interest. On the whole, I don't know the detail of uh, obviously. Uh, uh, Tom Arthur would be the minister to know about the detailed movable transactions uh, bill itself. But on the whole, I would say just generally, we tend to try and engage with as many stakeholders as possible with any bill uh, to ensure that we can get... Because uh, the last thing we need as a government is uh, for a stakeholder to come to us further down the line when we are trying to draft legislation, uh, telling us, well, this actually affects us in such a way that it makes things really difficult for us or, or that doesn't work the way you want it to work. So, yes, it's only right that a government should engage with the, uh, all the stakeholders and make sure they get the information they needed. If there was an issue with that, I'm quite happy to talk to Mr Arthur to see what that detail was uh, and just take it from there. I, mean, I think, to be fair to uh, Mr Arthur, he's been very um, helpful in, in, and has engaged proactively with, with the committee in terms of that individual example. It just was to get that assurance moving forward on these SLC bills that the government was, was doing its bit, you know, to make sure uh, stakeholders are squared off. But I'm, I'm getting that reassurance from you. It's always the government's intention to ensure that we, uh, as I say, from the, from the very practical uh, point, that it actually is better for us to be able to be in that position and know where we stand. Thank you. Um, and then brief. So, uh, so just on uh, that particular uh, issue, Minister. So, also we've had the available transactions where Mr. Madell touched upon um, some of the issues. Uh, and in the previous session, there was a prescription of Scotland Act uh, 2018, where likewise there were uh, some issues that came up. Uh, and uh, and it certainly seemed to be that because there was such a, a length of time uh, from the SLC undertaking their work before bills were then brought into the Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, would uh, the government consider, um, before they, uh, certainly going forward, if um, any future SLC bills 
if there is something that's been sitting there for, for Tom's sake, five years. Uh, would the, the government consider then potentially before the bill then comes into the parliament to do some further uh, consultation uh, with stakeholders uh, so that um, it could potentially then draw these issues out? Because so I think it's fair to say, and, and this came up certainly in evidence on the movable transactions, and uh, I, was, uh, I was in the committee at the time of the prescription, uh, I think with, uh, with the subject matters and subject areas, uh, I think it's fair to say that probably not everyone fully engaged mm -hmm. uh, or organisations engaged because they didn't, didn't think it was really relevant for them. Uh, whereas if the, uh, if the government were to do some kind of further consultation before it then came into here, uh, it may actually then draw out some of those issues um, and, and then help the, the parliamentary process as we, as we go forward. OK, well, you can expect... I'll, I'll, I don't want to make a commitment here today, but I'm quite happy to take that away and have a look at it and possibly write to the committee further down the line uh, with regards to what findings we have, with whether that's possible or, if not, why we can't do it. You know, but uh, I'll just give me some time to have a wee look at that. Yeah. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Mr Mandel. Hey, thank you, convener. I was going to move on um, and just uh, touch... Uh, briefly on, on the National Care Service Bill, uh, which the, the committee um, has just reported to the lead committee on. Uh, but I don't want to kind of get into the, the kind of politics or the, the sort of, um, you know, a, a sort of spat uh, on the bill itself. Um, what, what I was more interested in uh, was hearing your, your thinking and the, the government's thinking on, on uh, the, the sort of concept of bringing framework bills uh, to Parliament that contain you know, a large number of delegated powers and, you know, in, sort of in this sort of specific example, I guess, you know, whether as a former member of the committee, you can, you know, sort of understand the challenge the committee is faced with when, you know, a delegated powers memorandum, you know, isn't really able to specifically say how the, how, how delegated powers would be used and just whether you, you, you recognise, I guess, whether you recognise that challenge. No, I, I can see how uh, certain members of the committee would look at a framework bill and think that, but on this occasion, the National Care Service, this is about co-design, it's been done, this is a, a new way of uh, kind of trying to think how we design policy and how we design a process and a system, and for the National Care Service, it gives us that flexibility that government needs in order to do that, so that we can get that stakeholder, exactly what the convener and yourself are talking about, with the movable transactions bill, so that we can actually have that level of stakeholder involvement uh, and those that use the systems and processes and get their kind of expertise at that level. But I can understand from a member of this committee where it becomes, uh, you know, I, I can understand how some would cynically think it's a power grab by the government to do what they want when they want, but that's not what this is about. This is about, it's never about that anyway, but this is about us actually ensuring that we can give a national care service that uh, all the stakeholders have had any, all kinds of engagement and have helped us co-design and ensure that that has happened. With regards to your report, I've not had a chance to have a look at the report myself. I'm quite sure that uh, Kevin Stewart, the minister, will probably have a look at that and probably be in touch. He's already spoken to this committee in the past and said that, again, he's emphasised how important it is he wants to work with yourself to make sure that he can make this uh, bill and this National Care Service all it possibly can be. Yeah, I mean, I guess following on from that, as Minister for Parliamentary Business, it's just whether you know, you feel framework bills that rely heavily you know, on, on secondary legislation give Parliament as a whole, you know, enough uh, opportunity to be part of the to be part of a, a kind of co-design process, um, and then specifically, um, you know, why why that prevents. Uh, you know, more detail being put. Um, uh, we, we didn't really understand why that prevent more detail being put on the face of you know primary legislation. We, we, we didn't really get to the bottom of that. On the basically on framework bills and uh, what type of bill that uh, we, we we use to take uh, a bill forward. That is, there's no exact science that will be done in such a way that uh, nine times out of ten it will be the traditional method that we do for putting a bill forward. But in this occasion, I think this is more a radical kind of new way of looking at it and trying to, because it is such an important, you're talking about a national care service that will touch so many people's lives 
And I think the important thing for us is uh, to ensure that we've got that level of engagement. And this way, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, it's a different way of being able to look at how we design, because the, the scrutiny will come from yourselves uh, through the process as it goes forward. And also, another committees as well, because I think there's about, last I heard, about seven committees all kind of feeding into the National Care Service uh, Bill. And once we get to that stage where we're uh, kind of pushing this forward, we'll, we'll be pretty confident that we've got something that's robust enough and will be able to deliver what people want. Now, for us, that's the most important thing on this. With regards to what bill, what type of bill do we use going forward, it'll it will depend. Uh, I, do you think I'm going to be coming forward with uh, hundreds of framework bills uh, as of today? No, but uh, it will depend on what the circumstances are and how we can deliver the, the bill and make it do what it really needs to do. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about delivering for people out there in the real world. And I mean, that's a, that's a point of consensus. Um, you know, I, I, I you know, share, the, share the sentiment on that. Um, but I mean, on, on the kind of technical aspect, that really is my last question. I mean, we we, we were, or some, some members of the committee certainly were concerned, you know, that that you know, going through secondary legislation, there is a there is a kind of lower threshold for parliamentary scrutiny. I mean, it, would, would you you would accept that with secondary legislation? I think being a member of this committee, you know, there's a danger within a, a busy parliament that secondary legislation gets less scrutiny. Uh, than, than, than primary legislation. I wouldn't believe so. Having been a member of this committee, I don't see anything that kind of uh, disappears. Um, Summondale, I think everything kind of gets looked at and debated. I, I really do believe that for this specific process, this is the best way forward for us. But with regards to your committee report, I'll have a, a look at the committee report. I've, as I say, I've not had a chance, because I think it just published on Thursday or Friday last week, so I've not had a chance to read it yet. But, yeah, I will have a look at it, and uh, I'll take it from there as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, Minister, uh, and to your um, officials as well. Um, I wonder what factors influence the Scottish Government's approach to delegated powers conferred on UK ministers in devolved areas? Sorry, I, I missed that. What Jen? factors influence your approach to get delegated powers conferred on UK ministers in devolved areas? I'll bring in uh, Susan just to answer that one. OK, this is on um, legislative consent, Mr Balfour. Um, if a bill gives powers to UK ministers to legislate in devolved areas, um, our ask would always be of the UK government um, to have a consent lock um, so that the consent of Scottish ministers would be required or to have concurrent powers um, so that we can do our own SSI in that area. Um, so there's a, there's a discussion between policy officials and that then would be a discussion between ministers um, on that. Um, I think it's fair to say that of late, in the majority of cases, but not all, um, where we've asked for these things, um, the UK government have have not agreed. Um, so, um, but that is where we provide advice to ministers. Ministers take a, a policy view, and there is a discussion in a, between our ministers and UK ministers um, on that, and also at an official level. Okay, I mean, I, I suppose following on for that then is. Um, what factors influence the Scottish ministers in reaching their view on whether power in a UK bill for UK ministers to legislate in devolved areas should be subject to a statutory requirement for Scottish ministers' consent? Is there different thinking around that, or is it the same thinking as we've had previously? It's, it's the same. I would say it's the same thinking, and uh, the, the, this, this kind of goes back to what I said earlier on, Mr Balfour, about you know, being able to have that kind of working relationship with colleagues in Westminster, uh, it becomes difficult when you can't pick up a phone and say, you know, something as simple as we're having difficulty with insert name of bill or what are you trying to achieve with insert name of bill and uh, so we can understand it. Uh, then we end up with a situation where it's just purely... Uh, emails and letters going backwards and forwards to one another and it kind of makes things a bit difficult for us to get to a stage so when we're making the decision it's how it affects the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government 
nine times out of ten will always want to put an SSI down to actually say that it's the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament that's uh, legislating on the issue. And I think uh, that's only right that we would uh, look towards that idea because I don't think it's a... We don't want to live in a place, regardless of who is the political party in government in Scotland, a place where the UK government is legislating too much on devolved matters. OK, again, and I suppose, again, just to kind of follow that one through, um, where powers for UK ministers in devolved areas for out with the scope of a statutory instrument protocol too? How will the Scottish Government facilitate scrutiny of the exercise of those powers in advance of those powers being exercised? Yes, Susan, answer that, if that's OK. Right. Protocol. Yeah, well, um, there, is, there is a review of the protocol going on um, between officials, Scottish Government and Parliament, and that is one of the issues that is being considered as to what is appropriate and how best to make things work, including how... Um, but that also does involve working with the UK government, which, as the Minister has said, can be, can be challenging. So trying to find a system which gets appropriate buy-in is something that we are looking at. And do we have a date of when that protocol discussions... I mean, are we at the start of a process? Are we halfway through? Are we drawing towards the close of it? I, would, I think we'd say we're at the, the start of the process. And in your kind of thinking, how long do you think that would take? It really depends on the... <laughs> I'm trying not to be political. No, 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 that's what <laughs> I, I, I asked if it was from your intent. So obviously you've got two parties that uh -huh. to negotiate this, so uh -huh. I appreciate that. But from your perspective, from your experience previously, how long would you think that would take? I mean, are we talking you know, months, weeks, years? I would, I'd be unable to give you any kind of idea whether it be next week, next year, or two years down the line, uh, because uh, basically that's the way things are currently. And uh, it, the, the problem would be to commit myself at this stage. I'm quite happy to kind of look at it and try and see, but any, it'd be very difficult for me to give you any kind of time scale because of the way things are at the moment with relationships. I mean, perhaps then, would it be possible for you to write to the committee, say, after the summer recess, to give us an update of where we are on that? Yes, I could say after the summer recess, which could mean after the summer recess and the one following that as well. <laughs> you know? I'm always an optimist, Mr Adams, <laughs> you know me. Thank you, convener. Yeah, thank you. And Carol Mochan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I wanted to ask just a few questions about the retained EU law bill. Um, and really, the first question, I suppose, is um, what impact do you think this bill will have on the Scottish Government and the wider Scottish Parliament? It's, uh, Carol, it's a difficult one for us to uh, kind of say here now because uh, trying to unpick uh, EU laws that have been part of our legislative structure since 1972 is uh, quite a difficult task and it's one that officials both in Westminster and in the Scottish Parliament, uh, Scottish Government, sorry, are looking at and uh, we're trying to find a way and we're working, we're constantly having ways to see how it will affect us and what way we will actually be able to deal with it. But at this stage, it would be difficult for me to say what, how the impact, there's, there's either a scale between uh, finding a way to make it work and being able to, to make it work in such a way that we can still have full scrutiny and still get through the process, or finding a balance where, where we don't end up uh, just uh, everything we're doing is EU retained law. Thank you. And do you have any specific steps that you're taking to identify what will be devolved to to us? Yes, officials are in constant uh, communication with their counterparts uh, down at UK government level and uh, they are trying to find out a way that will be. Again, if you asked me how that would be, be very difficult, like 1972, I was three years old. So, you know, I know I don't look at uh, Miss Malkin, but, uh, you know, that wasn't yesterday. And uh, the, the situation we have is that that's going to be time consuming and that's going to be difficult. But both set, this is one situation where officials on both sides are aware of the task and are trying to find solutions to try and find a way to make sure that we up here 
uh, find a way to retain EU law, and uh, whereas in UK government they've got other ideals. Okay. Thank Carol, you. Carol, just, I'm just going to come in just on yeah, that. Of course, are, are you also engaging with uh, uh, officials uh, and uh, relevant uh, government ministers? and other devolved administrations on that particular point as well. Yes, we are. I'm just laughing because I, I had to ask who my counterpart was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but, mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, but yes, no, we have been uh, ensuring that we can get that so that because we, we know how serious mm -hmm. the situation is. And we have been trying to get into a position where everyone is working together to try and, although there is a difference in policy between ourselves, we're trying to make this work. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, just a, a last question, just around sort of, um, dates and, and timing. And do, do you have any anticipated dates that subordinate legislation under the bill might come to us? Um, and do you think there'll be any peak times that scrutiny will be, you know, at a high level? It's a hard one uh, to come with that kind of level of detail for you, but probably my best bet would be that uh, we'll try and work with the committee in particular to make sure that you're aware of uh, anything that's coming through but for me to commit myself at this stage would be difficult and I'd be guessing it would be a case of pinning the tail on the donkey uh, but, uh, to try and kind of work out when that date would be but as I say as soon as we have further information quite happy to share with the convener. Okay, okay thank you. Um, any other questions for the Minister? No. Okay. Uh, Minister uh, and team, thank you very much uh, for uh, your time this morning. Um, it's obviously they're having a few action points that you will come yep. back to committee on. Uh, and if there is anything that uh, the committee uh, would like to write to you on afterwards, then we'll certainly do that. Okay. So, so thank you once again uh, to yourself and, and officials. And uh, and with that, I will close the session. Thank you. <laughs>